Amen. We'll have Pastor Art bring us the word this morning. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I really, really am thankful for all of your kind words. Uh, if you if you know much about me, you know I don't do well with uh, with recognition. It's not been one of my one of my strengths. I intentionally did not walk when I graduated or anything like that because I'm not one for all that all the ceremony. So it it really is is flattering uh, to to hear those kind words and everything. And and I'm just amazed at what God has done in our church. That's that's really the exciting part. It's not me. It's Him. You know, it really is. Uh, this morning, we, we'll start with uh, with some announcements. Uh, choir practice continues 5 p.m. on Sundays, except not tonight. There will be nobody here at church tonight. So if you try to come by, it's going to be an empty house. Get full, you know, eat plenty, go home, put your feet up, enjoy the afternoon. I know I will be. Uh, we are having lunch following morning service, uh, so don't leave right away. Make sure you, you get something to eat. Uh, breaking Barriers starts, actually they started this morning, but starting tonight, every night through Wednesday, they're going to have different guest speakers over at Fountain of Life. If you've never been there, I strongly recommend it. My first experience going to Breaking Barriers, I had uh, my left shoulder. I couldn't raise my arm above this level. I had I got prayer that first night, and I was healed like that. That was my first, that was my first experience ever with a religious healing or with it with the spiritual healing and that day i became a believer I, I was always skeptical before but then that happened and i was like well there's no denying it now so really i encourage you whatever things that you might be going through just go there and just listen to the word uh if you're not one for a loud environment bring your phone or the, the little uh, foamies if you don't have foamies make sure you stop by their front desk on your way in they have some extras in there they do they do like it loud in that church um Tricks, treats, no tricks. I always mess that up. Treats, no tricks is going to be Saturday, October 7th. That's next Saturday, starting at 11 a.m. We're going to be going out and handing out some goodies to the to the neighborhood. Um, part of those goodies, I did get confirmation from the uh, Gideons that they're going to be providing us some um, New Testament Bibles that we're going to be able to put in there. So we're going to be sharing the word. We're going to be sharing with our neighbors right here, whom none of them are in this room right now. There's not one person that goes to this church that's from this neighborhood right there. And so our goal is to change that. Our goal is to let the community know, hey, we're here for you. We're, we're, we want to be a part of the community, not just another establishment that people come and go to. So uh, we'll be reaching out. If you want to come, you're free to dress up. Keep it uh, kid friendly. Um, but I'm, I, I haven't picked out a costume yet. Jen's got something in mind. So we'll see what, what that all looks like. But we want to we want to pour some church into the community in front of Halloween, you know, maybe get some hearts in the right spots. Uh, as we go through the month of October. Um, the uh, We're going to have a building fund special offering next Sunday, uh, a.m. and p.m. Um, so we continue to collect money for this uh, air conditioning unit that we need to get uh, repaired. Um, so if you feel so led um, to, to make a, a special offering, we'll be collecting that next week. Uh, we also will have on that Sunday, um, we're going to have our second team leader lunch meeting. We'll be providing some lunch because we know what it's like to go to church in the morning and then have to stay after for something else. So there will be food here. We don't want hangry people in a meeting about leadership. We want to make sure everybody's on the same page and, and we'll be bringing that lesson in uh, next week. There will be no PM service October 15th. Uh, we're going to be going over to Riverside Baptist Church for their singing at 6 p.m., so make sure that you join us there. Harvest Festival is coming up October 21st, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. We're really starting to get some progress on that. Lots of uh, craft vendors are, are putting in applications. Uh, if you know people, make sure that, they're, um, that you let them know uh, that we're having this so that they can come in and sign up for it also. Uh, we do have some um, volunteer needs that need to be met. So if you want to volunteer for the day, if you want to claim a certain spot, maybe you want to be able to sit down and enjoy watching the kids pick ducks, that's the, that's a hot spot to be because you don't have to do a lot and you make a lot of kids happy. But if you have uh, cooking talents or whatever, you know, let us know. We'll, we'll make sure you get plugged into the right spot uh, on there. Uh, we are starting our 
open mic night the fourth Friday of each month. So every fourth Friday, we're going to have a service here. Uh, and basically, it's not going to be a, a sermon, uh, but basically it's going to be an open mic night where you can come in and just sing and worship and pray to the Lord because that's what we need. You know, we can get messages all day long, and I'm not trying to downplay the, the importance of a message. Believe me, I know that. But what's really important is that we come in here and we worship and honor the Lord. So that's the goal of that is just to come in here and however you feel led, obviously we want to keep it, you know, worship songs and, and, and ways to honor God. But we really want to just fill this house with prayer and worship and praise. Uh, the next inspiration is Sunday, October 29th at 6 p.m. over at Simons Creek. So again, we won't have service here but we'll be going over to Simons Creek to support them in that. Um, for those of you that are visiting, I noticed we have a couple of visitors this morning. We have some items for sale out in the foyer and in the uh, fellowship hall. Those, uh, any purchase that you make goes toward our building fund. Um, the bags and all the sewn items that you see there in the foyer were hand sewn by Joan in the back there. Um, she does a great job. This is a great time to start getting ready for Christmas. I, I went into Lowe's, at, uh, what was that, yesterday, and all of the uh, all the Halloween stuff is basically sold out. Yes, it's gone. Uh, but now all the Christmas stuff is getting load up, loaded up in there. So if you don't want to have to buy something generic for your family members, there's the place to go back there. She does a great job, and there's loads of stuff back there. There's also liquid embroidery back in the back. Uh, and there's um, preserves made by Pat back there. So th those are, are a hot item. Make sure you get some before uh, those are all gone. Uh, getting down to the bottom of this, we have a lot of stuff going on in this church. I want to thank you guys for, for supporting us in all these crazy things that we've been doing and, and just bringing this back. But part of that is, is we got to take care of our building. So uh, on November 4th from 10 to 2, we're going to break out the pressure washers. We're going we're gonna to break out all the, all the stuff that we need, and we're going to just love the church back. We're going to put some time and effort into the church. So if you're so able uh, and you can come out here and help, if you've got a pressure washer, if you've got a blower, anything like that that you can bring, uh, we just want to get the church back up, you know, looking really nice and, and getting ready to go into uh, this new season. That is it for all of the planned um, announcements here. I do have one additional announcement. Uh, the sink in the in the first bathroom, if you're coming in from the fellowship hall, it, it broke off of its off of its drain. So do not use that one. The toilet's fine, but all of the bathrooms, I know they have men's and men's and women's signs on there, but they're all single stall. So just go and lock the door, and uh, and they're all available to you because I know some of them. Are a little bit more accommodating than others so uh, just be aware that there's tape all of the sink you can't mess it up it's it's pretty clear which one is not working so that is it for the announcements um, and so let's just take this to the Lord and, and hear what he has to say for us Lord we just thank you so much for your for your blessings today for the honor to be able to come here and worship you and to hear your word Lord, I ask that your words be my words and my words be your words, Lord, and that the Holy Spirit come and fill this place and just lead us and guide us as we go into this sermon. Lord, we thank you so much for your blessings. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, happy October and happy fall. Uh, as you can see, our, our church has been once again turned over by Angie and uh, Judy. Judy. I'm not sure where, where Judy went off to, but there, but. They did such a good job, and I always love this time of year because we start to see the transitions happen a little bit faster. It takes a lot of work, and it looks fantastic. Thank you guys so much. Um, but we finally have some cooler days. We're going to have some, some bonfires, some campfires. Got to go fishing yesterday. Had a great time. Might have given uh, Debbie a little bit of a heart attack because we stayed out later than we wanted to. But, uh, but it was really just a, a great day, and I love this time of year because we get to just – really get out and enjoy God's creation. And I think we're going to really see that. We've got the fall festival coming up. This church has come a long way, and I wanted to take a few minutes to just talk about that before I get into the sermon. A year ago today, we started our outdoor services. We went outside and we said, you know what, we're going to take back what COVID stole from us. COVID stole so much from the small church and so much from the community because people got afraid to go to church. 
And we said, you know, last year, this time, we said that's not going to be the case anymore. And what so many churches did a year before during COVID is that they went and they moved their church outside. And so we moved it outside. And one of those services, like we just had a great Holy Spirit in pouring. And he said, do it again. Yes. That was the message. Lord, do it again. Amen. And so we claimed it back. And ever since that service we've seen the return. We've seen it coming back through. So I'm getting up here in front of you again today and saying, Lord, do it again. Yes. So everybody get up. We're going to go outside in the parking lot. No, we don't need to go outside in the parking lot again. We did that. We, we've been down there. And that's just it. We don't need to do the same thing over again. We, God took us from the batter's box, and now we're on first base. We don't want to go back to the batter's box. That's not how you play baseball. We want to look to second base. Or maybe, Lord, do it again. Let's get a home run out of this. Yeah, yeah. Let's see what he has in store for us. Here's what our church did in the past year since the first time we said, Lord, do it again. We had our spring fling. We honored our first responders with an appreciation breakfast. We adopted families at Christmas and Thanksgiving. We established a brand new go bag ministry for the foster kids in our community. We had a great car show. We had many in-house events. We had baptisms and we even had, I'm saying it now, a few new members. We have one, but I'm, I'm proud to announce that we've got two more coming and I think two more right behind that. The growth is coming. God is working in our church. And you know what? I know you guys said thank you to me, but it's not about me. It's about him. Yes. And more, and, and not more importantly, but it's about you guys. If it wasn't for you guys, if it wasn't for your willingness to put in the effort, to put in any apprehension, to put in the skepticism, like, I don't know if this is going to work. This seems like a lot of work for something that may or may not happen. You put your faith into what God was doing and we've experienced the growth. So I want you guys to look around the room and congratulate and thank each other for all of the hard work you've done. I want to say a special thank you to every person out here who has put in so much effort. We're not gonna, we're not gonna be first year Christians over and over again. We're not gonna be first year Olivet Lakes back from COVID over and over again. We are going to set our eyes on second base. We're going to keep our eyes set on the Lord and see what he has for us because he might tell us to go past second base, past third base, and come on in for the home run. Just let's believe in him. Let's put our faith in him. And again, thank you guys so much for everything that you've done for this church. I, I'm excited to be to have the pleasure of leading this church and shepherding this church and getting to see what happens. It, it, it's a great, great privilege to serve you guys as a pastor. So this morning, we're going to go ahead and shift gears and we're going to get into this morning service because we're, we're already pushing time and I got a lot to get through. But we're continuing our Just Jesus series uh, and we're going to have to do a little introspection this morning. We're going to talk about things that, that often it feels like we look at the world and we can see how crummy the world is, how many messed up things. We talked about it already this morning, that the world just seems to be going to pot and the devil's out there just ravaging the place. I saw a quote the other day that said, just think of how important your soul must be that the devil goes out every single day and pursues it and tries to steal it. It must be an item of great value. So we have to keep our guard up. We have to always keep looking Amen. toward the Lord. And so today we're going to be looking in Jesus's uh, parables and to see what he specifically taught us. That's this series, Just Jesus. What did he have to teach to us? And the power of parables is so strong because it does cause us, not only are they great because they help us to look at other people and be like, hey, you see what Jesus said? I, I think you should look at it. It also helps us to read that and say, oh, I see what Jesus said. I need to correct myself. I need to turn around a little bit and I need to be careful. What's interesting about the parables is that so many times that lay people in the church that the story is so good that you think it's a true story. I hate to tell you, but there's no real uh, prodigal son. There was nobody that was ever the prodigal son. And yet we can all look at other people and say, oh, I know somebody who that story is about. I know that story is about me. 
Isn't it amazing how Jesus' words applied to everybody? It didn't matter that he came in 2,000 years ago. Today, we know prodigal sons and daughters who have turned around and come back to Jesus, that have come back to God, and we can celebrate their stories. So this morning, we're going to be going through a parable that gives us a warning, a parable, and then some direction from Jesus. We're going to the book of Matthew 18, uh, or the book of Matthew, chapter 18, and we're going to look at three different sections here. So the first section is Matthew 18, 1 through 6. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. It seems like the world is always trying to drown us, that the world is always trying to take us out. The world wants to destroy innocence. And we know that all you have to do is turn on the television. Look at programming that's designed for children. There is so much stuff out there that is designed to destroy innocence. When you listen to young people talk to each other, the young people who are innocent get picked on for their innocence. Almost as if it's a, it's a, a right or a passage of, of becoming an adult that you go through hardship that you personally inflicted on yourself. That's not what God had intended for us. That's the sin of the world trying to get in, trying to take us over. And we as adults are often responsible for stealing these children's innocence, for saying things and doing things and acting in ways that it destroys their innocence. Let's remember that scripture. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. God isn't just talking about little kids. He's talking about every single one of us. God sees us as children. He has two sets of children. He's got the children who have chosen him and who are going to follow his will. And he's got the lost children, the ones who are going and seeking other things, the ones that he wants desperately back. But he's not going to go out and force them. He has to allow them the will to come and seek him because he's not going to force them on one direction or the other. We have two possibilities in this scripture. One opportunity or one option here is whoever receives a child in his name receives him a great blessing. The second option, though, whoever causes one who believes in me to sin would be better off with a millstone around his neck in deep water. So how are we doing, church? How are we protecting our loved ones? How are we ministering to our children and our families to make sure that they're not going in the wrong way? It's so easy to blame other people, to blame society for the ills that our kids are going through. But oftentimes we stand by, we watch our kid about to step off of a ledge. And instead of going and guiding them back and saying, nope, come back to the Lord, we're like so many people when we pick out our phone and we start video recording to see what the collateral damage is. We can't just sit and observe as our kids fall off the path as they say, you know what, that school taught me this. I don't think I believe in Jesus anymore. And we say, okay, well, you know, you live your life the way you want to. No, stand in the way. Stand in front of them and say, I don't care what they said. I don't care what you've heard. Come, listen to the word. Come, let's read the Bible together. Let's see if God speaks to you in this before you go and make that decision. We should be doing everything possible to make sure that our family members are turned around. And yes, sometimes it won't matter how much work you put in. It won't matter how much talking you do. They're still going to go down that route. Any one of us who's a parent has watched their kids make a bad decision after a bad decision after a bad decision, and ultimately they have to face the consequences. But that doesn't relieve us of the obligation to stand in the way and try to redirect them every time they try to make a bad decision. We have to be there for them. We need to watch out for these outcomes because one is blessed and one is cursed, and there is no 
middle ground. There is no fence that we can ride on. We're either hot for the Lord or we're cold for the Lord. And if we're in, if we're lukewarm, he says he will spit us out of his mouth. He doesn't want us to sit the fence. He wants us to make a decision and go from there. So now I've brought something interesting in, and I'm going to tell you a secret. Maybe not a secret, but today's the day to go and buy potatoes at Food Line. Because I went in there and I deliberately was looking for a bad potato. And usually, you know, everybody here has bought potatoes before. You usually can find one. I searched probably 12 bags and no, no bad potatoes in there. So if you need potatoes, today's the day to go. Go, go and get them now. But I've got this bag of potatoes and, and it's kind of a, an interesting analogy that we're going to put to this. God, Jesus has his own, his own parable here, but I think sometimes we can relate better to something that we see and use every day. And so we have this brand new bag of potatoes, and this is what the, the scripture is warning us about, is that we have to be cognizant of what we're putting in. And so when I, when I think about this bag of potatoes, there was somebody in a factory somewhere that was bagging up potatoes, and they had to do a quality check on this. Now, I want you to imagine that there was somebody that was at that factory who was just real mad at his job, didn't like his job anymore, whatever it was. He was mad at somebody, and he went in there, and he chucked in a bad potato. Now, by the time that potato gets to the grocery store, gets to my house, all that kind of stuff, we know there's not just going to be one bad potato in there. There's going to be a lot of bad potatoes in there. And so that's what this scripture is trying to tell us, is that if we're responsible for putting a bad potato in the bag and sealing it up and sending it out, when the day of reckoning comes, when the boss looks at the security videos to find out who's been putting the bad potatoes in, the day of reckoning is going to come. And it's going to be worse for that employee. They're going to be fired. They're not going to be hireable again into that job because they were deliberately doing the wrong thing. We're in the same position. If we deliberately do the wrong thing, and I believe even if we errantly do the wrong thing because we have the word, we have the instruction, and we should be open to correction, that we're going to be held accountable to that level. And that's exactly what this scripture says. It would be better to have a millstone around your neck in deep water than to be corrupting our children. This made me think of, of the way that our TV ads go and and one ad in particular that i saw recently it was this family they were all dressed in white they were sitting on a white couch they had a white table the room was painted white and they sat down with a white bowl full of popcorn and looked like it didn't even have butter on it white 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 even the people were white sorry hey, there was a in, okay but what was interesting is they sat down to watch the movie and they were watching gone with the wind and it got to that famous scene where uh, where Rhett, Rhett Butler says, frankly, my dear, I don't give up. And right at that moment, the son got shot right in the chest with a bright red paintball. And so the point of the ad, the ad is there to sell a service that can help you clean up your, your movies. So that way you get beeps instead of cuss words and all this kind of stuff. But what's interesting is that the next thing in that, in that ad is it moved forward 74 years to the future and they were watching a movie called The Wolf of Wall Street. Now this movie came out 10 years ago. It's three hours long. The movie contains 798 cuss words, 27 sex scenes, and three scenes of graphic violence. It's just one continuous beep. I did the math on it. That's one curse word sex scene or violence every 13 seconds for three hours. The family is getting lit up with paintballs. The whole room is rainbow colored because there's 15 people just standing there, pop, 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 shooting the family directly with that. The message is clear. We're letting it in. We're not shielding our family, but we let it in in the name of entertainment. And it's real easy to blame the world. It's real easy to say, well, I can't control it all because my kids, you know, they go to school and they hear these things. They go out in the world and they hear these things. And that's true. I remember once upon a time, I thought it was illegal to have a cuss word on a bumper sticker. And I see them all the time now. And it doesn't seem to matter what your convictions are, whether you're on the left side or the right side or whatever. I see the cuss words coming from everybody. I wouldn't be surprised if we went through some of the church parking lots out here and we saw cuss words on the back of pickup trucks. We're 
contributed. It's time to turn the mirror and look at it ourselves. I wonder how many paintballs I shoot in a day at my own family. We need to be careful. We need to be cognizant because if we steal that innocence, we are in big trouble. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. There's a difference between verse 5 and verse 6. We need to be getting away from being verse 6 Christians and get back to being verse 5 Christians where we're uplifting, where we're protecting, and where we're making sure that the things that we bring to our families are wholesome, including from our own mouths and our own actions. Fortunately, Jesus didn't leave us just with this information and saying, hey, you know what? It would be terrible for this to happen to you and then just leave us with nothing else. He goes on. When we go to verses uh, 7 through 9, Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into eternal fire. And if you, if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for your entire life for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. Now, it sounds like extreme measures, but when you're talking about eternity, you have to take extreme measures. And I don't believe for a moment that Jesus was sitting there and handing out the tools of surgery to people and handing them scalpels and knives so that they could go ahead and start amputating body parts. No, Jesus was offer offering us an operation to help us get right so that we can avoid those disasters, that we can avoid that pain. He wanted to help us. He wanted to give us direction so that we can continue to keep our eyes on him, that we can continue to go through this world. I can't imagine what our church might look like if we followed this scripture literally, if we didn't have the opportunity for the operation. I think the community might really be in here because they'd be really curious as to what this church does specifically to draw the pirates in. That's not the kind of church we are. We're not here to cut off our hands and cut out our eyes and, and hobble along. We're here to get better. We're here to seek his will. We're here to seek what he has for us. And we're here to be corrected by him. That's where it's hard. That's where we get into, into our own selves. Now, I want to be clear. Temptation is not sin. There is nothing in the Bible that says that temptation is sin. Jesus himself was tempted three times. He chose not to sin three times. But if you play with temptation, you're inviting sin in. We've all been in those shoes. We've all had something that bothers us. We've all had something that tempts us. And we've had to look and we've had to analyze that and say, am I going to play with it? Am I going to go down that road? Well, you know what? Maybe maybe I, I won't smoke this cigarette. Maybe I'll just put it in my mouth. Not smoking, you know. Maybe I'll just put it behind my ear just in case. And I'll, and I'll be strong and I won't do that. Inevitably, you wind up lighting it up. We have to separate ourselves from the sin. We have to separate ourselves from what is causing us to go down that road. You can't. Play with temptation because it will lead you to sin. Jesus didn't look at the rocks and be like, I could make them into bread. No, he said, Satan, get away from me. Get, yes. get these rocks away from me. Let me speak with my father. That's who I need to be in touch with. You need to go about your day. That's how we need to be. We can't be there. So going back to this, potato, this bag of potatoes. We know that if there's sin in here, if we've got one rotten potato, and unfortunately, again, no rotten potatoes in there. But if we have one rotten potato in there, we need to find it immediately. We need to be looking for that potato so that we can get it out of the bag to protect the rest of them. That's where we're going next. Jesus continues with another familiar example, the parable of the lost sheep, verses 10 through 14. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that heaven, that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. 
What do you think if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray? Does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search for the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the, over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Jesus goes out and finds the one. He left and found the one because he wanted you. And when you came into the church, when you got baptized, we were here celebrating your return. We weren't looking at and saying, well, you did this, and oh, I can't believe you did that, and I'm going to continue to judge you forever because of the things that you did. No, we celebrate the return. And that goes for us, too, because sometimes we find ourselves in church, and we find ourselves being astray. You don't have to be far away from the herd to be astray. Sometimes you can be in trouble right in the middle of the package. We have to be careful. When in, This is the account of Matthew, but in the same account in Luke, the Pharisees are looking on, and this happens when Jesus is sitting around the dinner table with the sinners. And the Pharisees are looking down their nose at Jesus and at these sinners and saying, you know, he sits with sinners. What kind of person does that? Look at how terrible those people are. And we could be like that. We could sit there and be judgmental of people. The Pharisees certainly were. But if the Pharisees had looked at the table a little closer, they might have found that there was exactly the number of empty chairs as there were them. That they should have been sitting around that table too because they weren't free of sin. In fact, they had a bear trap of a sin on them called pride. That they weren't even trying to escape anymore. They were just there and stuck together and wanting to judge everybody else. We need to look at this last, at this parable and we need to look out for each other. There's many a time where the sheep is in the pen, where the sheep is lost in the pen. There's many a time where the rotten potato is in the bag and we just need to find it. We had an incident with the sheep at my house recently. We were on our way, Jen and I were on our way somewhere, and Adrian called us up right before we pulled out of the driveway. I need your help. Something's going on. So we went in the backyard, and one of our sheep, sheep are not smart animals. Believe me, this is not a compliment when Jesus says you're sheep, okay? <laughs> this sheep had wound herself up in a tie-down strap. We have a little trampoline in the backyard to give them some, some shade during the day. Somehow she got her leg wrapped up in this cord and she was hanging upside down with her back leg two feet up in the air. She could not escape. I could not physically maneuver the strap off of her. I had to get a knife and cut it off of her. She was in the field. We didn't know, but she was astray. And the crazy thing about sheep is that sometimes they don't even make any noise when they're in trouble. Sometimes when they're in trouble, they just sit in silence. They suffer in silence and you don't even know something's going on. We don't know if she was there for an hour or if she was there for four or five hours. She was just struggling. And so we have to look at this and we have a decision to make. We have to find out what are we going to do with this. In the case of that sheep, we had a decision to make. Are we going to be late for where we're going or are we going to help this sheep out? And of course, we're like, well, we can't be late. We're just going to leave her hanging. No, that's exactly what Jesus said. You wouldn't leave a sheep out there to suffer and die. No, you help them out. You go in there and you take the time to cut them out. And then when you're late to wherever you're going, it's okay. You say, hey, I was, I was helping somebody out. I had other business to attend to. That's what Jesus is calling us to. The church is full of sheep that have hurt and have gone astray, and they need our help. They need our upbuilding. They don't need us to shun them. They don't need us to look at them and say, oh, well, you know what they did? Believe me, that's a worse sin because now you're forcing them out the door. It would be greater for you to, or be better for you to have a millstone around your neck. We have to come together as a family and seek to help those lost sheep, to restore them, to maybe pull them from the bag for a minute, but then to start finding ways, like what's, what's bad on here? Let's cut those bad parts off. This is still usable. This is still something that I have use for. And God said, some, said something even more. He's got a better resolve than just to cut the bad spots off. So that brings us to this last part that Jesus gives us instruction on how we're supposed to handle this situation. Verses 15 through 19. If your brother sins against you, Go and tell him his fault 
between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by the Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. So we're supposed to go to the person first. We're supposed to talk to them first. And now I'm going to I'm going to divert from that for a quick second because there are some times where you need to go directly to the pastor right away. If there's a criminal element, if there's something that's endangering somebody at the church, you go to the pastor. And the pastor will take the appropriate action. And yes, that those actions may have consequences for that person. That's the nature of the world. But unfortunately, there's a lot of pastors out there who will like to tell you, oh, you need to go back and read, uh, you know, uh, Matthew, and you need to go in and read 15 through, through 16 first. And then when you take care of that, then you can come to me. That's a cop-out, folks. That's your pastor not leading you. That's your pastor wanting to avoid a confrontation. And believe me, it's hard to deal with confrontation. You don't want to do that as a pastor. You want every day, every day to be like today where everybody's like, I love you, pastor. Oh, I love you too. High five. We're all having a great time. But there's a need for discipline too. There's a reason why the shepherd has a crook. Because the shepherd is supposed to go in and defend his flock. David didn't fight bears and lions because he wanted to. He fought bears and lions because he had to. And that's where the pastor comes in. If you ever go to the pastor and he says, well, you just read these, these couple of verses and you go and follow that instruction, you lead them right back to the parable of the lost sheep and say, no, sir, that's your job. Make sure that you're being taken care of if it's dangerous. Now, if it's not criminal, if it's something that you heard, if it's something that somebody else told you, now it's time to go back to this. And you go to that person directly and make sure you know the full story, that you know that you're taking care of that person. We would like to resolve things at the lowest level. We don't want to escalate something that doesn't need to be escalated. And certainly, we don't want to be going around and telling every single person about what one person is in and that they'd be the only person that didn't know that they'd done something wrong in the first place. Surely it would be worse, better for you to have a millstone around your neck. Don't let your temptation not to forgive become a sin itself. You too have to look in the mirror and make sure that you're not being tempted just to be ugly to somebody that, that needs care right now. They need uplifting. They need being, uh, being restored. Now, sometimes God takes that weakness. He looks at this potato, and maybe this is an old wrinkly potato. You guys have seen it. It's all wrinkled up, and instead of having these little eyes on there, it's got legs like a spider. And you're like, how does a potato grow in my closet? It doesn't make sense. Well, you know what? God looks at a potato like that, and he doesn't see failure. He doesn't see something that's completely ruined and useless. He looks at it with a farmer's eye. And he says, you know what? I can use this because I bought my potatoes one time. Jesus said, I came to the earth and I paid for all of them on that cross. I'm not doing it again. The scripture tells us next time he's coming, he's coming with a winnowing fork. And it's our job to make sure that the harvest is ready. So in order to do that, when we find that wrinkled up potato sitting in our church and we're not sure what to do with them, we need to find their skills and their talents. We need to take this potato and we're going to break it into some pieces and make sure that that person is restored. And then we're going to start planting those pieces of the potato. This becomes our seed potato. It starts helping the church to grow. And guess what? I hate to tell you, but we all used to be the wrinkled up, rooty, gross looking potato. You don't want to bake it, but you know what? Somebody planted it. And out of that, out of your testimony, out of your integrity, out of your work in the church, 
more people have seen what it really means to be a Christian. And they've gotten interested and they've come in and your roots have spawned off more potatoes and more potatoes. And that's the Great Commission, that we're called to make the harvest great, that we're called to bring in as many people as we can. We're called to minister to people. Don't let the fruit rot in the bag. Bring it out. Clean it up. Help them out. And then bring the whole congregation along. Don't leave the lost sheep just because it's inconvenient. I, had, I, I went to a church once where the pastor told us that every good church, every healthy church has a, has a back door too. Well, I'm going to tell you for a while that church's back door was way more busy than the front door. Because the church was more interested in the image of the church and making sure that it was flashy enough and making sure that new people came in. Well, there's only so many new people that can come in, but if you treat people poorly and you don't care for their needs while they're in the church, well, they'll find their way to the back door. And then the pews are empty. Fortunately, they had a turnaround. Their church is growing again. But yes, it, while it is healthy to have a back door, while it is healthy to sometimes tell people, hey, you can't be here anymore, you saw in the scripture, that's the very last resort. That's after every other possible option has been tried and that person has said, no, I still give my life to the devil. Then you say, okay, you can't be here if you're going to do that. When we call each other up, when we hold each other accountable, that almost never happens. We wind up growing and those people who were once lost, they're found and they share their testimony and the church continues to grow. God sees something much greater in you and me than we ever could see in ourselves or each other. Always remember that. We are his children. He is here to lift us up, to guide us, and to protect us. And so we always have to keep our eyes on him. Today we're concluding with a, with a communion. And I want, as we pass out the elements, um, Graham, can you all pass out the elements this morning? As we pass out the elements, I want you to remember that we're all at the table as sinners with Jesus. We've been saved by him. He's the only reason that we've been saved. And so we're sitting there and we're at the table. If you're sitting near the table, you can go ahead, Pastor. If we're sitting near the table and scoffing at people and looking down our noses at them like the Pharisees were, we're setting ourselves, we're setting our foot into a trap. And so we need to make sure that when we get these elements, when we say the Lord's Prayer, pay close attention to what you're saying. Listen to the words. What you'll find is in the words of the Lord's Prayer, you find that all of that scripture that we just read is reflected in the Lord's Prayer. It's seeking us out. It's telling us, hey, you were once lost and now you're found and come and sit at the table with me. I love you so much. I gave my life for you. I bought the potatoes. I bought your soul. I'm not paying for it again. It's done. Lord, as these elements are being passed out, Lord, we just pray over the elements now, Lord, that you bless this communion service, that you bless us in it, and that we are able to honor you and to come and return to the table to seek you fully, Lord. Lord, let us come with, with clean hearts, with clean spirits, always seeking you, always keeping our eyes on you first. In Jesus' name.
Let's go to the Father in prayer with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. On the night of the Passover, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. We are blessed as the sinners who came to the table who have been saved by him, that we're no longer sinners, that we are justified, that we are glorified in his name. What an honor and what a blessing that we've been given the opportunity to be fully forgiven for our sins through his gift for us. As we conclude, I want to invite you to the, to the altar. If you need prayer, if you've been praying for something, Bring your prayers to him. Always bring your prayers to him. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how small. It doesn't matter how big. He can act in that. We had a time of prayer before that. We have family members who've been diagnosed with terminal diseases. We have family members who are fighting terminal diseases. We have the financial issues. We have all kinds of things that we can bring to the Lord. And he says, just ask. So come to the altar. Ask him. If you're searching, if you're still seeking, Come to the Lord. Ask him. We'll be standing by to help you pray. If you're not sure what to pray, have somebody pray for you. If you're not comfortable with that, just come up here and listen. He'll pray for you. The Holy Spirit will pray for you. Justin, if you want to go ahead and start. Lord, we just come to you now. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the honor of being able to worship you and to, and to hear your word. And Lord, now we come to the altar, Lord. We seek you. We come to you in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys want to stand to praise